Welcome back. Welcome back, friends. We are here on Corporate Report Radio on this Thursday night edition of the broadcast. And it is the second half of the broadcast, which can only mean one thing. And I certainly hope you brought your appetite to the table tonight because we are ready for Food World Order with our good friend James Evan Pilato of foodworldorder.com. And as I understand, he's ready and waiting on the line. So, James, great to have you here once again tonight. I am here. I am on the line, and I thought you were going to say, I hope you brought your appetite because we're going to ruin it, but hopefully that's not going to necessarily be the case. <laughs> it, it tends to be the case in these conversations, doesn't it? So I have one to add for listening to The Enemy. One of my favorite ways is I subscribe to the Council on Foreign Relations podcast, and they send out, you should actually sometimes kind of be prepared for it because you can get pretty large video files coming down your iTunes, but I got one just the other day, U.S. Educational Reform and National Security, put on by the fine folks of News Corp, Stanford University, and more. And, of course, there's a book that you can buy to go along with it, but there's a, you know, hour-plus-long video, you know, equating education reform and, and national security. And, again, it's it's Condoleezza Rice and, and News Corp, so they have our our best interests at heart. Oh, of course. I mean, <laughs> all they want is to educate the young of today so that they grow up to be big, strong, healthy, capable, independent adults of the future, right? That's exactly right. Now, I'll, I'll even, I'll bet you one uh, American dollar here that uh, that's probably not how it's going to go. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet you one Canadian mint chip that it, uh, it definitely isn't. So, James, let's let's at least start our food world order coverage on on somewhat of a, a a bright note as it'll get worse unfortunately as we go it's always darkest before the dawn as the cliche goes but from the new york times huge rooftop farm is set for brooklyn brooklyn fast becoming the borough of farms last thursday bright farms a private company that develops greenhouses announced plans to create a, a sprawling greenhouse on a roof in sunset park that ex- is expected to yield a million pounds of produce a year without using any dirt. The hydroponic greenhouse at a former Navy warehouse that the city's Economic Development Corporation acquired last year will occupy up to 100,000 square feet of rooftop space. Construction is supposed to start in the fall with the first harvest expected next spring, 2013. When finished, the greenhouse will rank as the largest rooftop farm in the United States and possibly the world. This spring, Brooklyn Grange, another rooftop farm developer, is set to open a 45,000-square-foot commercial operation at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, aside from those sinister connections to the military, perhaps we're actually turning those into something for life rather than something for death. Well, I mean, it's a, it's not a bad idea, and uh, maybe we don't like those connections, but at any rate, it's an idea that hopefully other people and other companies can start taking up because it's an idea whose time has come. Occupy the public spaces and start using it to grow things. What a revolutionary concept. I know. I, know. I think we've joked many, many times that you end up having to come back around to the most simple, obvious, beneficial thing that we used to do in the first place. You have to make it all the way back around and go, oh, that's right. James, I know you 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 just want to talk about the Enviro Pig, right? Enviro Pig, Enviro Pig, <laughs> does whatever an Enviro Pig can. G E Enviro Pig project stops their research. This from CivilEats dot com. The University of is it Guelph, James? Is it pronounced like it yes, like it looks? It's Guelph. University of Guelph, the Canadian university de- that developed the genetically engineered Enviro pig, announced it's closing down its research. The Center for Food Safety is now calling on the U.S. FDA to stop any work on approving the GE pig. The Center for Food Safety has criticized the developers of the Enviro pig for engineering an animal specifically to fit into large scale and highly polluting concentrated animal feeding operations. That's CAFO, C-A-F-O's Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. We hide a lot of our, our actions, and George Carlin talked about this in, in our euphemistic language and our acronyms. But the CFS has also criticized the genetically engineered Aqua Advantage salmon developed by Aqua Bounty Incorporated, which is also under review by the FDA, which was similarly 
engineer to grow better in the confined tanks of industrial fish farming operations. There's a lot of green lipstick on this pig, said Andrew Kimbrell, executive director for the Center for Food Safety. The whole idea of genetically engineering a pig to fit into an unsustainable production model and then dubbing it Enviro is ridiculous. Given recent industry and consumer backlash, it's no surprise that funding for this misguided research has dried up. And there's more from GuelphMercury.com and Aqua Bounty and, oh, Ontario Pork. Well, I'm going to confess that I've heard about this EnviroPig project before, but I haven't been following it or, or looking at the details. So I'm a bit confused here because the University of Guelph was developing this EnviroPig. They're shutting down the research so why would the Food and Drug Administration still be working on approving it? That I could not answer for you, but perhaps it is within some of the links and some of the supplemental information here. And I'll, I'll admit to you as well, my man posted this on foodworldorder.com, Adam actually, who's out of Canada, well, there you go. It's a it's a bizarre story. And of course, it just goes to show what these GMO monstrosities are going to be all about, which is not actually uh, trying to make the world a better place, as they say, but just to basically adapt things so that they can live in the most squalid and terrible conditions imaginable. And then we'll put them through it and then we'll eat it up. So um, so unfortunately, that's pretty much the game plan for these monstrosities. I guess it's good to hear that the uh, the research project is being shut down. But that it's uh, the the approval is still going ahead is kind of bizarre, and and as we know on on more geopolitical levels, of course we're we're all working on harmonizing our our trade and and such between the three North American community nations, right? What happens in one is happening in the other soon enough. Mm -hmm. So James, here's a couple of threat stories. Monsanto threatens to sue Vermont if legislators pass a bill requiring GMO food to be labeled. And as Alternet.org puts it, the world's most hated corporation is at it again, this time in Vermont. And I, I can't even remember off the top of my head. I was just having a conversation with my girlfriend the other day about just the the hypocrisy of things that are allowed out there in the world by the state but then we're not even allowed to know the the created things that we're eating, and God knows what they're going to do. Oh, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it's bizarre to me to think that they even can sue for the uh, the threat of actually labeling GMO foods. But uh, unfortunately, that's the system you're living in, and that's it has to be fought against. I just like the fact that the uh, the article opens by saying that Monsanto is the world's most hated corporation. <laughs> Which uh, I'm not sure if it's the most hated, but it certainly must be up there. It, it, I would think so. And, you know, we, we discussed when I think it was Forbes named them as one of the best companies of the year. Yeah. And... <laughs> I almost forgot about that. But that is back in the archives of New World next week, isn't it? So the other threat story from Natural News takes us to New Zealand. Proposed natural health products bill in New Zealand would fine individuals 50000 for making a cup of unapproved herbal tea. This is Senate Bill 510. And exactly, you know, as, as we see it in one place, we'll see it kind of mirrored in another. And it is, it's the, it's the main, you know, it's the main kind of crown countries. And that's the U.S. and Canada and Australia and, and the U.K., Exactly right. Just like Echelon was the uh, spying system that was in exactly those countries. And they also work together on things like this. And of course, this is what we've been seeing going on in America for some time now, all this food safety legislation, which is really about shutting down farms and stopping people from doing things. And, uh, and this particular story looks like it nexus is in with, uh, with the WHO's uh, Codex Elementarius, doesn't it? Trying to stop people from daring to make their own herbal teas oh my god you must be fined fifty thousand dollars for that uh-huh uh-huh and and we recall i i dug it up a couple of months ago on on media monarchy playing a of several several years old commercial that had mel gibson in it basically about the swat team breaking down his door and he finally says oh you know calm down fellas it's you know it's just vitamins and it goes on to say, you know, the United Nations is pushing this bill. And I, I recall maybe seeing it on actual television once or twice, but now it just kind of lives on in YouTube. And, and of course, anytime we see the suspicious Mel Gibson character, we always kind of wonder what's going on. But 
Well, yes, there's lots to be said there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but it, absolutely, I think it is part of a, a, a demonstrable coordinated agenda. And for people who haven't looked into the actual documents of Codex Elementarius, this might be a good time to do so because I think this this story gives a, at least a glimpse into the type of future they want to have, where everything that uh, that you have in your in your kitchen and in your cabinets is going to be regulated, uh, not just at the national level, although that's where it'll be distributed or where the regulations will be enforced, but it's really coming from on high from the UN and from uh, the globalists who are seeking to control everything. And as we know from cyberspace war, of course, our refrigerators will all, you know, rat us out as they'll be connected to the internet of things. It's a nightmare future that I don't even like to think about but unfortunately we have to and yes pretty soon there will be nowhere to hide because everything will be nexused into that internet of things and they'll know everything that you have on you at all times and uh, we have to avoid this we have to stop going down this road james a, a couple of other stories one from foodsafetynews.com debate heats up over poultry inspection proposal and i'll just kind of mention on my twitter feed at media monarchy you can use hashtag food world order, and I highly recommend other folks do it. I think it's a, it's a great tag, and it's, it's a way to kind of spread this information uh, around. And I have food safety news auto, you know, anytime they post something, it automatically goes out on my Twitter feed. And another story, James, that we've tracked off and on throughout the weeks and months, and again from naturalnews.com, EPA approved GMO insecticide responsible for killing off bees and contaminating the entire food chain. You know, I think just the other day, as it's finally, you know, spring is starting to spring up here in the Pacific Northwest, sitting outside work the other day as, you know, the the bugs have, they've also kind of hatched, and the joke was made that, you know, ah, oh, mosquitoes, you know, I hate them, and of course, you know, the eugenicists kill all the bees, but we're left with mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, funny how that works. And of course, they do all the spraying programs in many cities for the mosquitoes specifically. But uh, but I'm sure that's uh, all for the public good as well. But uh, but absolutely, this is such a disturbing story. And I hadn't actually seen the actual uh, the actual study here, and you've got it linked up in the notes. So I certainly hope people will take a look at this and uh, and take a look at uh, what what is being done right quite out in the open uh, now, just absolutely horrific. And as that article that you, you linked to there goes on to say, I mean, basically this could go all the way up the food supply. This could lead to the destruction of catastrophic chain reaction in the food supply. We already know the bees are dying. So the first domino in that pe that set has already fallen. And uh, wow, some pretty scary stuff. It, it's even kind of a strange feeling when you're outside and you see a bee you know, whatever kind of bee it is, you kind of see it and go, oh, a bee, I, I remember those. And then it's it's already kind of there. It's already, you kind of, as as we've noted before, we absorb a lot and we've been bred that way with our conditioning and our schooling, which, of course, as we noted at the top with CFR is related directly to national security. But we've been, we've been trained to absorb all these, you know, bits of order out of chaos to kind of keep hurting us along. And we just kind of take it on and go, oh, yeah, that's right, the bees are all gone. Yeah, it's it's absolutely, it's not funny, but um, it's uh, funny, not ha-ha, that mm -hmm. how quickly we can become acclimatized to uh, to things like this and the just wholesale destruction of vast swaths of the biosphere. And that doesn't bode well for, uh, for us going down the road as, unfortunately, these changes are likely to become more and more serious as more and more of mm -hmm. these monstrosities are rolled out from bare crop science and the other biotech companies that like to hide behind once again as carlin would note a nice euphemism for genetic tinkering uh -huh. and uh, their monstrosities and i was going to mention when you mentioned codex alimentarius that i, I always end up referencing a an article on farmwars.info and i believe you actually talked to barb peterson recently of farmwars.info who, who's also right here in oregon right that's right. Yep. And uh, I I would once again direct people to your earlier conversation with her on Media Monarchy. And there's an article that basically connects and lays out the connections from the people and the paperwork from, you know, the, the Nazis to the United Nations to Agenda 21 to Monsanto to Codex Alimentarius. And you see it and you go, there it is. There, there they are. 
They have names. That's right. Uh, we, we referenced that article in the interview, but unfortunately we had one caller who uh, didn't want to accept the idea of fluoride being bad for you because uh, I guess he looked at a website that he didn't like. But, um, but once again, I hope people will mm. at least start taking a look at that research for themselves if they're not familiar with it because uh, fluoride is not your friend. And there's all sorts of things that connect uh, some of these big companies like Bear to, uh, to some very shady history. Mm -hmm. So, James, one more, which will set the stage for the binge and purge. From the Los Angeles Times, radioactive particles from Japan detected in California kelp. Radioactive particles released in the nuclear reactor meltdown in Fukushima, Japan, following the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami, were detected in giant kelp along the California coast, according to a recently published study. Radioactive iodine was find in found in samples collected from beds of kelp in locations along the coast from Laguna Beach to as far north as Santa Cruz after uh, about a month after the explosion, according to the study by two marine biologists at Cal State Long Beach. The levels, while most likely not harmful to humans, were significantly higher than measurements prior to the explosion and comparable to those found in British Columbia, Canada, and North northern Washington State, following the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. According to this study published in March in the journal Environmental Science and Technology, and no, James, you may not read that research because people much smarter than us have done it all and taken care of it and we're not allowed to look at the research. Exactly right. I'm sitting here trying to click on the link to open the uh, study and it's uh, not letting me do so. Oh, how wonderful that is. And, uh, and just on that note, for people who don't know, something like 8,000 scientists have now started this uh, campaign to try mm -hmm. to get rid of these uh, paywalls for access to articles. But on that note, um, absolutely interesting. I, uh, the only question I have is when these samples were taken, because iodine-131 only has a half-life of eight days. So I'm assuming this occurred during the first month or two of the, uh, the crisis when it was still belching out into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But still very interesting very uh, very worrying not particularly surprising i think for people who know what what was going on there uh-huh and and again i'm i'm here in oregon and we're just kind of i guess bracing ourselves all up and down the west side absolutely well unfortunately it continues to be an environmental disaster that we only begin are beginning to understand the scope of but on that note let's take a short break <laughs> All right, welcome back to Corporate Report Radio France. We're here on this Thursday night edition of the broadcast. And since it is Thursday, we've been talking to James Evan Pilato of foodworldorder.com and many other websites besides. But of course, you can get the links to all of the uh, excellent websites that James maintains from Food World Order. So I hope you'll go there. And of course, the, uh, the show notes for tonight's episode will have links to all of the articles that we're talking about. So you can go into them in greater depth. And of course, James always puts in all of the links and and uh, links to the studies, et cetera. So, uh, so you can go directly to the source material. It's an extremely valuable resource. So I hope you guys out there are making the most of it. And on that note, James, we have a little bit of time left. So let's binge and purge. <laughs> well, and I think we, we almost got busted there talking about The Simpsons during the break. So our transition from our, our previous story about radiation in California kelp takes us to the top of the binge and purge of beer, bugs, drugs, and more. There is a mural in Chernobyl of the Simpsons and their iconic, you know, Springfield background with the nuclear plant. Street artists take on nuclear industry one year after Fukushima. And James, there's another interesting story about new soft serve beer foam now available in Tokyo. I'd like to say this surprises me, but it does not surprise <laughs> me in the least. And there's a, a, another update I added that says study makes beer. Uh, study says beer makes men smarter. For, I guess I need one. That's my stumbling. <laughs> over, I'm stumbling over my tongue here. <laughs> so many other things on the binge and purge, James. There's no way I can read them all into the record, but the ones of of bigger note to me. Another 11th and another tragedy. There was a massive earthquake in Indonesia triggering panic, but fortunately no tsunami. And of course, PM Cameron was there trying to sell weapons, I believe. And of course, there's always some world leader around when tragedy strikes and they're able to grandstand. But 
Yeah, interesting how that works. And yeah, he's uh, on an Asian junket at the moment, selling uh, uh, basically different parts of military manufacturing. And he's got Rolls Royce representatives and things like that with him. So, yep, absolutely. And interesting how that always seems to work out in combination with some of these world leader visits. There's a lot of that mm-hmm. going on. Study claims NAFTA led to obesity in Mexico. So there you go. Enjoy our fantastic, uh, you know, free market and all the amazing foods that it can get you. Tobacco farmers claim Monsanto and Philip Morris poisoned them. And this goes to courthousenews.com. And this story takes place out of Argentina. James, I heard while I was at work the other day, just kind of, you know, just out of earshot, I heard someone say, as they grabbed some tuna off the very bottom shelf, well, if it's good enough for Wick, meaning women, infant, children, meaning, I believe we've discussed this, that the women, infant, children, the food stamp, the welfare stuff, is the worst food. And I think it's got to be part of keeping, you know, a part of our overarching kind of class warfare that we see keeping those at that level. Mm -hmm. We also, James, will wrap up on the big pharma notes. Johnson & Johnson fined $1.1 billion, and whooping cough outbreaks higher among children already vaccinated. Yes, imagine my surprise. All right, lots and lots and lots, lots. and lots of things for people to go through. We only began to really skim the surface of that binge and purge. So once again, I hope people will go to foodworldorder.com and, of course, mediamonarchy.com, where they can find uh, James's podcast and his own live radio show mm-hmm. Friday mornings, 10 a.m. Pacific. That's it. All right. I hope people will tune in. Uh, James, always a pleasure. And we should let people who are listening on the radio know that this will also be available later on on YouTube at Wiki World Order's YouTube. And people who are watching the YouTube can, of course, also go to corporatereport.com and republicbroadcasting.org for the live radio show. So that being said, James, thank you as always for your time. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Talk to you all tomorrow night.